Yep. Hi, handsome. Yeah, the name tags weren't out when you said it, but I thought maybe that'll make people look for them and maybe they'll ask for slides wide.
Good morning. I'm not sure that's necessarily true, Pastor Allen, but he just told me he gets more nervous when the guy's not here to make the announcements, trying to figure out who's supposed to make announcements than he does when it's time to get up and preach. So, <laughs> it's good to be back. Uh, welcome to the Village Church. We're glad to have everybody with us this morning. Uh, I am grateful to be back. Uh, thank you for all your prayers while I was away at camp. I had a wonderful week with over 100 boys in Pennsylvania uh, sharing the Word of God, and uh, so thank you. It's good to be home. I uh, also had a great week of vacation Bible school last week with kids taking over the whole building and a lot of fun with that, and so you'll hear a little bit more about that in just a second. Uh, but before we get started this morning, uh, we want to start off with a couple of announcements. First of all, for all of our children, uh, Miss Reva is in the back, and so if you would like to go to uh, for some activities with uh, Miss Reva, you're welcome to go ahead now. Um, also, for all of our youth, uh, we will have Sunday school, and you'll be dismissed after the Apostles' Creed this morning. Um, if you have a name tag, and with COVID, the name tags disappeared, now they're back, now they're going away again, um, we want you to take your name tags home. So if you have a name tag, uh, it's out on the table as you go out this morning. Make sure to pick that up and take it home with you. Uh, if you had one and it's not out there and you don't know what happened to it, let us know and we'll check through a couple of other boxes that it might be in and we'll see if we can find them. Um, but we're going to a new uh, attendance system. And so we want you to wear your name tags. It helps us to get to know everybody. Um, but uh, we'll be, you'll be hearing more about the new attendance system in just a couple of weeks. Um, something a little unusual this morning is we have a closet up front. We don't normally put a closet in front of the church, but as part of Vacation Bible School, uh, our, our children bring offerings to the closet which are gonna go to our local schools. And so we wanted you to see how much stuff went in the closet this week. The closet is full, it's overflowing, there's more bags sitting around it, and there's still three more weeks for any of you that would like to go out and find those incredible bargains at Walmart or the Dollar Tree or anywhere, Target. Um, if you'd like to uh, invest in some school supplies for our local schools, you can do that. Also, if you would like to make a donation to the closet, uh, we will continue to accept those for the next three weeks uh, financially and you can make those out to the church and mark closet fund on those. Uh, we had the opportunity to hear from two area principals this week. Uh, Jay Willits, uh, the new principal over here at to Tokoy Creek, who was the principal at Pasetti Bay when we started the closet program. Uh, he was here and shared about the hundreds of students who have been impacted by your gifts to the closet fund over the last four years. And then Rebecca Keffer, who's the principal at Osceola Elementary School, uh, she shared as well about the, the hundreds of students that are being impacted uh, by the clothing that you give, uh, by the school supplies, and how they're able to be a part of the whole school because of the gifts that you provide. I also had the privilege of giving uh, Principal Willits a check for $2,000 uh, this week when he was here so that every student whose family lives below the poverty line will get a Tokoy Creek t-shirt the first week of school. Thank you for providing those. He was overwhelmed. We love how you love kids, and so thank you for that. A uh, couple of other announcements this morning. Um, our Prime Timers group will be meeting this Friday. They're going to be having lunch together at the Beaches restaurant over in Volano Beach. And so if you'd like more information about that, uh, you can contact Debbie Emerson or Pastor Mike and they'll let you know how to uh, get involved with that group. Uh, but they always have a lot of fun wherever they go and they're going to have a great time on Friday at noon over at Beaches. Um, also, don't get too used to me standing here because I'll be gone again next week. Uh, our mission team uh, with youth and leaders is headed to Charleston, South Carolina. We'll be leaving Saturday morning. And so we'll be gone, not this week, but all of the following week. And so we'll appreciate your prayers as we serve uh, the residents in the beautiful city of Charleston. I think that's all the announcements we have. So let us begin our worship by standing together and joining in the singing of the wonderful hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. <laughs>
you join me in our responsive reading that comes to us from Psalm 89. I have found David my servant with my sacred oil I have anointed him. No enemy will subject him to tribute, no wicked man will oppress him. My faithful love will be with him, and through my name his horn will be exalted. He will call out to me, you are my father, my God, the rock, my savior. I will maintain my love to him forever, and my covenant with him will never fail. If his sons forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, if they violate my decrees and fail to keep my commands, I will punish their sin with the rod, their iniquity with flogging. Once for all I have sworn by my holiness, and I will not lie to David, that his line will continue forever and his throne endure before me like the sun. Apostles' Creed was written uh, many years ago in our history of the Christian church as a way to combat the heresies that were taking place during that time, and, and so we have that today as well in our, in our churches. And so uh, this was the minimum that all churches, all Christians should believe together. And there's a famous quote that says, we believe far more than there is in the Apostles' Creed, but we should not believe less than is in the Apostles' Creed. So let us unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated. At this time, we'll join together, or we'll have a hymn medley. I'm getting out of the way. our service and we're very excited to um, our praise music will be three favorite hymns and the first time through I'm going to play in the low notes when you hear me switch to the high notes like for the second verse if you'd like to sing join in holy 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 and mighty fortress and Jesus loves me
like a musical little sermon, wasn't that? <laughs> Great job. Thank you so much. We are blessed. Blessed. Today's first reading comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, remember that formerly you were you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcision that done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. That preaches itself too. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. First, we'll go in silence and I will lead us corporately. Father in heaven, creator of all things, everything that we can see and is known, everything that's unknown. For you created us in this little orb that we call earth, not to be alone, but, but to live with you as you dwell with us. Thank you, Father creator of all. And as we bask in your glory and adore you, Father, we come to mind things that we have done where we have not heard your voice. We have not helped the needy. We have not done your will. And for that, Father, we are sorry. Yet, we're thankful that through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, He has reconciled us, He has broken down the barrier and brought us close to you in your Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. 
Thank you for your forgiveness. And we, these hearts of adoration, thankfulness, and contrition, we bring these prayer requests to your throne, Father. We pray for Joyce Friedel, for Don, Baby Revere with her heart issues, Joe and Harold, Calvin, Jim, Paul, Joseph, and Ted. We pray for healing for Rhonda, Roy, Morgan, Gwen Collette, healing from ALS. We ask for prayers for healing for Nadine, Virginia Mahoney and husband, for PJ Tarr, Dave and Sally. We ask for healing for Frank, Lord, healing for Mary's hip, for Bill and Mary, for continued healing for Julie. We ask for Lois, healing for Lois as she's struggling with stage four cancer. Peace for her sister, Lydia. We ask for healing and travel mercies for Norman. Prayers for Marguerite and Cassie. Miriam Lewis, who's healing from her, a hip surgery. We ask for prayers and healing for Ben Fritz, who's struggling with stage four cancer and his family. Ginger D'Amato and her needs for a physical therapist. We ask for healing for Dick Costanzo and strength for Marilyn. We pray for Jean and Laura Stanichek. Healing for Matt Cohen and wisdom for his doctors. We pray for Karen, who's suffering from stage four lung cancer. Ken Tay, healing from cancer and surgery. We ask for healing for Pat Farmer, Mo Taylor, Chris, Becky Cromwell. We pray for Troy, Jamie, and Randall. Pray for healing for John Glass's father. Brian and Kevin, healing for Miriam, Susie, Charlotte, Ginger, and David. We pray for Derek, John Wells, Art, and Rosalie. Tom Day, Ed Hill, who's healing from surgery. Tom Hill, healing from surgery. Chris, Kristen Pickering. And we ask for peace for Connor and peace for the Smith family as they are mourning the passing of Linda. Healing for Connie Fisher and Jeremy Huddleston and family. We also ask for peace in Israel Peace in Cuba and all those who are protesting for a better life. For freedom, Lord, especially freedom to worship you fully. And we also ask for prayer requests that are deep within our hearts. And we lift these prayers to your throne, Father, with the words that your Son taught us to pray, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us go to a time of our offering, reminding you that our plates are at the sides of the, uh, uh, of the room and at the back uh, towards the doors. If you are watching online and care to continue to support, you can find us on wgv.church. Let me pray and then we'll conclude with the, our doxology, our thanksgiving. Let us go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father for your goodness and mercy. And Father, now receive these gifts 
for you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. Receive our tithes and our offerings for the mission of this church and the church universal. And let all of God's people say, Amen. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus, hear my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. If I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? None but me, Lord, none but Thee. Just a closer walk with Thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. When my feeble life is old. Time for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely, oh, to thy kingdom shore, to thy shore. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. That's uh, Chip, Deb, Deb, and Julie. They brought a smile to our faces, didn't they? Oh, amen. amen. Friends and beloved, let us go to our, uh, our scripture passage this morning, six verses, Dude, Psalm 23. I want to invite you to stand as you are able as we read the word of God together.
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. There's a funny story about a retired couple that got into farming and acquired a few sheep. At lambing time, it was necessary for them to bring two newborns into the house for care and for bottle feeding. As the lambs grew, they began to follow the rancher's wife around the farm. And she was telling a friend about this strange development. What did you name them? She asked, uh, her friend asked her. Goodness and mercy, she replied with a sigh. You get that? Goodness and mercy. She was referring to, of course, to that line in everybody's favorite psalm that surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our scripture lesson for today, today refers to sheep and to shepherds. It's probably the most familiar image in scripture. God is a shepherd. We are God's sheep. Sheep were important to the lives of the ancient Hebrews. That's perhaps why the sheep are mentioned more than 500 times in the Bible, more than any other animal. For King David, who authored much of the book of Psalms, the metaphor of the sheep and the shepherd was an obvious way to think about our relationship with God. He had vivid memories of life as a young shepherd before he became the warrior and king. Thus, he begins his popular and beloved Psalm 23 with, The Lord is my shepherd. And of course, this descriptive language is carried all into the New Testament concerning Jesus. He is the ultimate shepherd of God's people, as well as the unblemished, sacrificial lamb of God. Now, unless you've grown up on a sheep ranch or spent a lot of time at the petting zoo, you're probably not all that familiar with sheep. In any case, you probably wouldn't think that being described as sheep is very flattering. Although I'm not sure who should be more offended, the sheep or humans. <laughs> Most of us probably prefer to think of ourselves as Mustangs or Mavericks. Too smart, too free-spirited, an individual to go along with any herd. When most of us think of sheep, we may seem to think of them as feeble-minded animals, too dull to think for themselves, and therefore they follow along with the rest of the herd, sometimes into dangerous and deadly situations. However, this image is a little bit lacking. When you really get to know a little bit more about sheep, you begin to realize that being a good sheep, that is, a sheep that sticks to the herd with the flock and tries to remain close to the shepherd, requires some basic qualities that are also essential for being a disciple or true follower of Jesus Christ. And like the disciple of Christ, the sheep benefits from belonging to the flock gaining safety, guidance, nourishment, correction, care, as well as the opportunity to be useful and productive. But membership 
also has its responsibilities. In an, our more maverick-like character, we're sometimes resistant to those responsibilities. It requires the work of the Holy Spirit to make us into the right kind of sheep to follow Jesus, especially to those of us who, if you don't mind a bad pun, I know, Ed, you'll probably enjoy this, those of us who are seriously hard of hurting. Ah, oh, yes. There it is. Had to get it out some. We need to ask ourselves, now what? If the Lord is my shepherd, now what? What does being a good shepherd require? How can we make sure that we're in the right flock, obeying the good shepherd instead of wandering off on our, uh, on our own and following a stray herd? What we need to know and do as members of Christ's flock, what is it? Well, let's look at that for a few minutes. In this psalm, some say it addresses so much of what God provides us. And so, literally, you can look, open up Psalm 23 and look at every verse and every statement line by line and say, there it is. He's my supply. There it is. He's my healer. There it is. He is my salvation. He is my shepherd, my leader, my guide. He provides for us. David gives us three reasons why faith ought to be in and fear ought to be out. Why we should spend our time worshiping rather than worrying. There's a slide that shows our first point, which is that the shepherd is responsible for the sheep. Now, this entire psalm is based on the imagery of the Lord being a shepherd and people being sheep. So we read, the Lord is my shepherd. The analogy of the relationship of God to his people be, uh, being a shepherd to sheep is found throughout the Bible. For example, two verses. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead who are, young, who are with young. Isaiah 40, 11. And then we go in, uh, uh, even to Psalm 100. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. I want to focus on that, that God is compared to the shepherd. And that is a 24-7 job. The shepherd is totally responsible for the sheep because the sheep depend entirely on the shepherd for everything. The sheep depend on the shepherd for food, for water, for shelter, for safety. So being a shepherd is an around-the-clock job. Now, the reason that that truth is so magnificent is this, that the welfare of the sheep is the work of the shepherd. The sheep are not responsible to meet their needs that are, that are the responsibility of the shepherd. Think about it. God has made himself responsible to meet your needs. He has everything. He is everywhere. He can do anything, and therefore, any need you have, he's guaranteed to meet it. Amen. That's why in the 10th chapter of John, verse 11, he is called the Good Shepherd. In Hebrews 13, he is called the Great Shepherd. Therefore, when Jesus becomes your Savior, he becomes your Shepherd. And it is the shepherd who becomes responsible to meet all your needs. I heard about a Sunday school teacher that decided to have her first grade class memorize Psalm 23. She gave them a week to learn it. Little Bobby was so excited, but he just couldn't remember it. He tried and tried and tried, but he just could barely get past the first line. Well, on the day that the kids were scheduled to recite 
Psalm 23 in front of the whole church. Little Bobby got up and he was so nervous when it was his turn, he stepped to the microphone and simply said, the Lord is my shepherd and, and, and that's all I need to know. <laughs> well, that is all you need to know. Next time, you're tempted to worry, to fret, to despair. He is responsible for your needs, for yours and my needs. The second point is that the shepherd is, the shepherd responds to the sheep. He's powerfully responsive to the sheep. The name that is used here for God is one of the seven names used for God in the Bible. He is called here, Jehovah Rohi, which literally means the Lord, my shepherd. The shepherd who guides the sheep to shelter, who guards the sheep from danger, who gives the sheep their food. In other words, he meets all their needs. And that's why David goes on right to say, I shall not want. Another little story about a little girl who came to her mother and finally told her that I've learned the 23rd Psalm. When her mother asked her to recite it, she started off by saying, the Lord is my shepherd, he's all I want. What a beautiful confession. Well, the Lord Jesus is not only all you want, you'll discover that he's all you need. Mm. If you knew that for the rest of your life, all your needs were going to be met, why would you worry? Well, the obvious answer is you wouldn't. And yet we do every day. But why? Now think about this. There is only one way all of your needs are not going to be met. And that is if God lies. You see what worry does? Worry calls God a liar. When God says, I will meet all your needs. When God says, if I am your shepherd, you will not lack one thing. Then there is no need to worry. The author Stephen Ambrose wrote a magnificent book entitled Undaunted Courage. It's the story of Lewis and Clark and their expedition. Thomas Jefferson realized that when Lewis and Clark reached the Pacific Ocean, they would be without money, clothes, or provisions. To deal with that situation, Thomas Jefferson did something never before done in the history of this country, and never done since. He provided a letter of credit for Lewis, authorizing him to draw upon any agency of the U.S. government anywhere in the world for anything he needed. Here's what he wrote in the letter that he gave him, quote unquote, I also ask the consuls, agents, merchants, and citizens of any nation to furnish you with those su supplies which your necessities may call for, and to give more entire satisfaction and confidence to those who may be disposed to aid you. I, Thomas Jefferson, President of the United States of America, have written this letter of general credit for you with my own hand, signed it with my name. This will go down in history as the most unlimited letter of credit ever issued by an American president. Well, that's exactly what God does for his people, you and I. He's given us over 7,000 promises in his word, each one of them a blank check promising that whenever we come up 
against a real need in our life, he will meet that need. Amen? Now, I know many of you are sitting there saying, well, I had a need in my life, Pastor Mike, and God didn't meet it. That's not true. If God didn't meet it, it wasn't a need. If you have a real need, God's going to meet that need. The shepherd is powerfully responsive to the sheep. Third point. On the screen. The shepherd is personally connected to the sheep. He is personally connected to the sheep. Now there is one little word in this verse that makes the entire passage operable for you and me. In fact, it's the most powerful word in this psalm. And it's certainly the sweetest, sweetest word. And that word is my. My. You see, you may know that God is a shepherd. You may even believe that God is the shepherd. But the question is, can you say, the Lord is my shepherd? This whole image of sheep and shepherd is very, very personal. Faith in God through Jesus Christ is intimate and personal. It is the perfect understanding that the Lord is my shepherd, and here is an, a timeless example. The sheep know the shepherd, and the shepherd knows his sheep. John 10, 27 says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Today's Middle East shepherds, Modern times, their lives are not radically different from that of the first century counterparts. They wander aim endlessly in search of fields where the sheep might graze. Don't forget much of that area of the Middle East that we come to understand as Israel and Jerusalem is largely Negev desert. They are searching endlessly every night. The sheep are led into a protected area. It's called a sheepfold. Sometimes there are three, four, or five flocks gathered by a number of shepherds into the same area. The shepherds, they take shifts, staying up through the night, protecting those sheep from anything that would come from outside uh, and, and devour the sheep in the morning. You might wonder, well, what happens with that collection of, of uh, smelly sheep, let's say? Is there any hope of separating them from one another? But actually, it's quite simple. Each shepherd calls the sheep, and the sheep hear the shepherd's voice. And they immediately begin to move towards that shepherd. After a few minutes, all the sheep are separated into their own flocks and the shepherds lead them away even in a crowd sheep know the voice of their own shepherd and they follow it an amazing thing happens in your relationship with God when you come to know him as a shepherd when you say my shepherd he says my sheep Saying, my shepherd, is the ultimate act of faith. But when he says, my sheep, that's the ultimate act of grace. There's only one way to know that the Lord is your shepherd, and that's to make sure that the shepherd is your Lord. You see, you can have a personal relationship with God as your shepherd. To me, all sheep look the same but they don't look the same to a shepherd. I was reading about how a good shepherd can locate one sheep in a flock of up to 2,000 in less than five minutes by the way he holds his head, by the way he bleats, by the way he walks, or even by one look into the eyes to see 
if he's sick, or whatever characteristic uh, is ascribed to that one sheep. The shepherd has a personal relationship with every sheep. This shepherd, this shepherd, wants to have a personal relationship with you. The beautiful thing about this shepherd is that he doesn't just give us everything we need. He is everything we need. If you're hungry, he is the bread of life. If you're thirsty, he is the living water. If you are in the dark, he is the light of the world. If you are lost, he is the way. If you need, he has it. If he doesn't have it, you don't need it. Mm. But that raises the question, how do you make the Lord your shepherd? It's as simple as, get this, A, B, C. We all know our ABCs, but I want you to know these ABCs. First of all, you must acknowledge that you need a Savior. You see, before the Lord becomes your shepherd, you've got to admit that you need one. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 that all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned each to his own way. Secondly, or B, you must believe that he is who he says he is and can do what he said he would do. God sent his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Jesus Christ, by his death on the cross, has paid the price of our sin and the way back to God. The Father is possible for those who believe. Finally, or the third part is C, and that's committing. Committing all that you know of yourself to everything you know about God through Jesus Christ. As the sheep follow the shepherd, so you must follow him. There is a true story about a little boy who was desperately ill. The doctors had told the parents that they had done everything they could do for this little boy, and they sent him home to die. The parents called their pastor and asked if he would come and visit and come over, uh, and he came late that night to visit the child who was in and out of consciousness. He was unable to speak, and never acknowledged that the pastor was even there. The pastor was alone in that child's room upstairs and left later that night. He got a call early the next morning that the boy had died. He went over to the house to console the parents, pray with them, to weep with them, and to read scripture with them. After a while, the parents asked the pastor if he could explain something that had happened. They said, in the hours before our son died, and at the time of his death, he was holding on to his ring finger. And he died in that position. Do you know why? pastor sat back with a broad smile on his face and said, I wanted to talk. I wanted to talk to your son, who I knew was going to die, about the importance of knowing Jesus. But I wanted to speak to him in a way that was clear and that he could understand. He said, I took your son's left hand and I held his thumb and I said, thee. Because we're talking about thee 
one-of-a-kind God. Then I took his index finger and I said, Lord, because it's the Lord who cares for us. For the middle finger, I said, is, because God himself is right here. For his ring finger, I said, my, because it takes a personal relationship with Christ to go to heaven. With the last finger, I said, shepherd, for he is the one who died for us, who cares for us, and who will take us to heaven. In Jesus' name. He looked at the parents and said, your little boy didn't say anything, but he heard me. Because before he died, the reason his hand was around that finger was to say, the Lord is my shepherd. My friends and beloved, if you can say, the Lord is my shepherd, you have no need to worry, no need to fear, for he is everything you need. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. Will you join us in our closing hymn? If you would stand as you're able.
receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.